AppWrite functions have received a massive upgrade and have been a key focus point of the 1.6 release. Just this Monday, we announced the addition of local function development, which means you can now build and test your functions in a local environment without having to deploy them, but we're not done yet. Today, I want to reveal a new set of features added to the function ecosystem, and these features focus on reducing friction points, speed, and flexibility. So first, let's talk about speed. So when it comes to functions, we have to deal with something called cold starts when we first execute a function. And this is because if a function has been sitting idle for some time and it hasn't been executed, it takes a second for that function to power up. But once that function is active, then subsequent requests are gonna be processed much faster. Now, as developers, we're always looking for ways to optimize our code and speed things up. And even if cold starts only happen a certain percentage of the time, we still don't want any delays affecting our users. This is why I'm proud to announce we now have faster function cold starts. This means that most users can now expect to experience 10 to 20% faster cold starts, and in some cases, up to 50% faster, depending on your code base and your runtime. Up next, I'm excited to introduce dynamic API keys in AppWrite 1.6. So this addition is gonna make API key management much more simpler and secure, but how exactly does this work and what does it mean? Well, with dynamic API keys, this means we no longer have to create and manage API keys for our functions and pass them down through environment variables. AppWrite will now create a dynamic API key on every single request, and once that request is complete, that key will expire and can no longer be used. So a new key is created on every single request, and this allows us to be much more secure. It means we don't have to manage our keys and rotate them if we accidentally expose them. It creates a really easy experience. So let me show you how this works, and it'll make much more sense once you actually see it in action. So to demonstrate how this works, I created a function locally and deployed it, and we're gonna use this function to access that dynamic key. And then I wanna show you how to configure that dynamic key to be able to actually set scopes to it and make requests to an app right backend. So this is the function. We're gonna go into the function here, and I'm gonna need this URL because that's how I'm gonna trigger the function. And I also just need to make sure that in my settings, execute access is set to any, because if I'm using a URL, I need to make sure I can trigger it without passing in any credentials or anything like that. Now, one thing I did wanna mention is that if you look in my environment variables, I have nothing in here and I never created an API key for this project. So with that being said, let's go into the code. This is the function, simply returns back hello world. Very easy to understand, that's all it is. Now, I have Postman set up here and what I'm gonna do is make a request to that URL. So we're gonna send it and this right here says hello world that's what's in our function, that much should make sense. Now, in order to actually access that dynamic key, I'm gonna create a variable called key here. And to access it, we can access this by going into request.headers. And we have this new value called x dash appright dash key. And this allows us to access that dynamic key. So we never pass this down. This is automatically passed in into every function. And this key will be created on every single request. So. Let's just do this. Let's take this key and let's return it. So let's change that for hello world. And I'm just gonna deploy this function and we're gonna see that key rotate. So we'll just do app right push and we're gonna select the function and that's called test. We'll deploy it and we'll test this in Postman. Okay, so the function deployed. And if I go back to Postman, when I make this request, instead of hello world, we're gonna see that key here. So we're sending the request, this is a cold start. Now here we see dynamic and then we see this key. Anytime I make this uh, send request here, we see that this key is gonna rotate on every single request. Now this right here is created, then it expires and that request forces AppWrite to create a new one for this function, so pretty cool and as you saw in the console, we never had to create it. Now, before we start using this key and setting scopes to it, I wanted to show you something that really differs between a local function and a deployed function. So this right here is a deployed function. And as you see, that key rotates on every single request. Well, a local function acts a little bit differently. So what I'm gonna do here is run this function locally. And if you don't know how to do this, I have a full video on this topic where we talked about this. So I have Docker running and I can run this function by calling AppWrite run functions here. So I'm gonna spin this up and this is gonna be on port 3000. So it's a local function once this gets activated. So I'm gonna take this URL right here and we're gonna bring this into this new request here. So this is localhost 3000 and I'm gonna send this request. 
So we're going to see a dynamic API key. The only difference here is this key won't rotate with every request. When we're running this locally, this key will expire after an hour. So it's a little bit different. Just be aware if you're not seeing that rotation process and you're running it locally, that's why it's happening. So next, what I want to do is actually set some parameters to this key and actually use it within an app write function. So the way that we're going to use this key is by passing it into a client instance as we connect to our AppWrite backend with an SDK. So in this step here, what I'm going to do is go ahead and connect to our AppWrite backend and show you how to make a request and how to manage permissions with this key as we configure everything. So we need to do a little bit of prep work here and we'll continue from here. And for this, we're going to use the node SDK. So we'll just import the client class and I'm going to make a request to my users and just pull in all the users from my backend. Now, you don't need users here. This is something that we're just going to use to mock that request. So don't worry about having data in there. That part doesn't matter. We just want to make sure the request goes through. Now, the next step here is to go ahead and create the client instance. So we'll do const client, and this is going to be new client. And from here, we need to set our project endpoint. So we'll do set endpoint. And... With this, we have a new value that we actually have access to within AppWrite 1.6, and that is this variable right here, our function API endpoint. So by default, AppWrite will already know what that endpoint is once you're connected to a project. So we can just pass this in without actually having to pass down that environment variable. So the next step here is to pass in our project ID. So we'll do dot set project here. And what I'm going to do is just paste in this right here and change this to project underscore ID. So this is also a value that we don't need to set. This function will already know what this project ID is. And then the last step for our client is to do set key right here. And this is where we take that dynamic key and we pass this in right here. So from here, before I get my users, I'm going to set data right here, and this will just be an object. And we're going to set this to users like that. We're going to put a key here. This will be null at first. And then I'm going to return data right here. So before we can do that, we need to change this to JSON right here. So we're just going to return users. If we don't get users, that value is going to be null. But now we can just go ahead and connect our users. So we'll do users is equal to new users. And we want to pass in our client instance right there. And here is where we can actually make that request. So we'll do a try catch here. So try catch and here I'll just get this error and we'll just log this out. So we'll do log and if something goes wrong, we want to log out the error and in the try statement, we're going to make that request. So we'll do data and we'll just get our users and this is going to be equal to await users dot list. Now, if something goes wrong, what I'm going to do is just change users to that error response. So we'll also set that right here and this is just so we can visualize things a little bit better. So we'll do JSON dot stringify and we're going to pass in the error so in this first step we're actually going to get an error but before we actually run this let's go ahead and just deploy this so we'll do app write push and we're going to select functions and we'll do test and we're going to test this with a deployed function before we do this locally because there's a few things that i need to make sure that you see so once this is done we're going to jump back into postman and test this request Okay, so the function is deployed. So let's go ahead and check this out. So right now, in theory, we should connect and return some users. We passed in our key. Everything should be good. But let's go into this deployed function right here. So this is that live URL, and we'll hit send. We're going to see this error. So it looks like everything actually worked, but we are not authorized to make this request. So what's happening here is we have this dynamic key, but that key doesn't have any scope set with it. So traditionally, you would create an API key, set some scopes to it, then pass in the key manually into the function. Well, in here, if we go to our function, we can just go ahead and set the scope at the function level. And now the new dynamic key will have all those scopes. So right now we're blocked because we're trying to make a request to our backend but we haven't set any scopes here. So right now, I'm just gonna set auth to the scope. Let's just set databases here. If you have any other scopes that you need to set, set those. But now every dynamic key that is created will have this scope right here. So let's update that and let's give this a test. So now if I go back to Postman, let's send the request and look at that. Now you don't need user data. The whole point was just to show you that the request works. So that worked, everything checks out and that's good to go. Now we still need to consider local functions because we deployed that function. We set that scope in our console, but the local function doesn't have those scopes. So we want to make sure that we pull down those latest changes. And I want to show you what I mean by this. So we'll just do app write run functions. And we're going to run this function here. So right now the deployed function has that scope. 
We saw that it works, but the local function, if I switch to this, let's make that request, we're still gonna see that we don't have those permissions. So we're unauthorized to make that request. So to fix this, now that we made those changes, we can always just go ahead and pull this down. So we'll do app write pull. We'll go ahead and select a function and we're gonna hit test here. And this is just gonna pull down all that configuration from that function that was deployed here. So we just wanna go ahead and bring that in and we're gonna run this function again. So we'll just do app write run functions. And now that we pulled that down, we should have that scope here. So let's just check that out. Go back to the local function, hit send again. And now we're able to access that. So that's how we're able to make sure that we have that in the deployed function and within the local function. For this next feature, we'll jump back into our console and we're gonna take a look at how function filters give us more control over how we view our function deployment and execution history. So starting with deployments here, if I go down to the deployments table, we now within AppRite 1.6 have this filters option right here. And this simply allows us to filter data down. So if I select a column here, I can filter deployments down by size, build time, status. So let's say I wanna find every single deployment that failed. I can simply go ahead and find that right here. Now, we also have the same for executions. So in the executions table, if I go to filters here, I can filter executions down by HTTP method, status code, triggers. I can even filter them down by date. So in created here, I can go ahead and select a specific date. So greater than, and then I'll select the calendar. This allows me to select any date and time. And this just gives me more control over my entire function ecosystem. We have also added the ability to set delayed function executions, which can be set directly from your app right console. So this means we can now schedule a function to run once at any single point in time in the future. And this can be done under the executions tab by selecting execute right here. And once we pass in our function parameters, we can now set this function to run on schedule. So we can select a single point in time, like September 1st at 3.46 p.m. And this function will execute once at that specific date and time. So for our last announcement today, I'm proud to say that AppRite functions now support binary executions. So this means that we can now send binary data to an AppRite function as well as return binary files as well. So in simple terms, this means that we can now send more than just plain text data or JSON data. We can now send audio files, image files, PDFs, and any other forms of binary data. Now, historically with AppRite functions, this was only possible with certain runtimes, as well as a little bit of extra work on the developer's end. So for example, with a Node.js function, if you wanted to send binary data, you would first have to base64 encode it, and then that would work. But now this works natively with every single runtime and with no extra work on your end. So as I always do, I just wanna get right into it and show you a demo so you can see exactly what I'm talking about and how you can do this for yourself. So what we're gonna do here is create a minimalist function that accepts some binary data, and we're also gonna respond with that data. So we're gonna use Postman for this. And what I'm gonna do here for the binary data is send a image file, and then we're gonna respond with that right here. So you're gonna see this binary data go back and forth. So in this function, before we get started, I wanna show you some modifications we've made to how you can process different body data and how you can create different responses. So with request.bodyText, this is how you can accept text data. We now have body JSON, which allows you to accept JSON data. And for binary data, we now have body binary. So this allows you to accept that binary data. And for responding here, we now have res.text. And then we have res.json and res.binary. So this is how you can accept it. This is how you can respond. So first, we want to accept this binary data. So what we're going to do is go ahead and create a variable called file. And we're going to say rec.body binary. And that's all we need to accept the binary data. So that's now in file. And to respond with this, we're going to change this to res.binary. And we just need to pass this file in here. And we also want to set the status code. And then I want to set the content type. So the type of data that we're going to respond with. So we'll do content dash type. And this is going to be equal to image forward slash PNG. So we're just going to send back an image file. So we get the data and we respond with it. So inside of Postman, let's go ahead and actually send this data. So I'm going to send a post request. We're going to go into body and I can send binary data by selecting binary right here. We'll select a file. I'll upload a new file and we're just going to use this app right logo. 
And I just want to make sure that it's uploaded. So we'll finish that process. And now let's test this out. So when I hit send, we should get back this image. So right here, this is the binary data. This is something that was not possible natively before or with all runtimes. And now we can send and retrieve this binary data. So pretty neat. So that concludes it for all the demos in the AppRite 1.6 functions ecosystem. As always, if you have any questions, leave me feedback down in the comment section and I'll see you all in the next video.